This presentation is spillway pier seismic failure mechanisms. Today, we're going to go over the just the main objectives of this presentation, the key concepts for this failure mode, event tree and failure progression of peers under seismic loading, um, other things to consider when you're evaluating this failure mode, the factors that influence this failure mode, and the stability and strength of reinforced concrete sections, um, some analysis, methodology for screening and finite element analysis, and I'll go over a quick uh, case history and example. So the key objectives is to be able to understand the failure mechanism of a peer under seismic loading, learn the analysis procedures to evaluate this failure mode, and evaluate what the risk to a structure could be due to this failure mode that could potentially lead to modification of a dam. So some of the key concepts to keep in mind is um, this, this failure mode is related to gated spillways with intermediate piers. So it's a, um, a, a, a structure that is loaded not only from the, the pool on the pier itself, but also the loads on the gate. Uh, the spillway gates are anchored to the pier and transfer loads to the structure. So the, the structure needs to be evaluated for those loads as well. The pier is a reinforced concrete failure structure, I mean, a reinforced concrete structure. So the failure mechanisms that are presented under the reinforced concrete mechanism presentation are going to be used and discussed within this uh, presentation as well. So it's something to keep in mind and th that can be used as reference. So there have been no known failures due to a peer failure under seismic loading. Like I said, I will go through a case history, but um, there wasn't a release of pool due to, the, due to that, um, what we're gonna see a little bit later. So of course, a, the key parameter in this failure mode is the reservoir load. So you have to evaluate whether you would have that reservoir pool together with the seismic shaking occurring at the same time, what the probability of those occurring at the same time is, and it could potentially be too remote. So it could be something that you could, are able to screen out, but a lot of times, especially in the uh, Western United States, we see that these failure modes can drive risk because you have a high pool that can occur with a, and you have a high seismic hazard in that area. So like I said, large hydrodynamic loads can be transferred from the gates to the pier. The pier is also subjected to inertial loads. And a lot of times the pier has not been designed for this loading. A lot of times we see that the piers are designed for maybe 0.1 G and we can be evaluating accelerations greater than 0.5 G, maybe even up to 1.0 uh, 1, 1 G. Um, one of the things to keep in mind as we're talking through this failure mode is that um, you have loading in two directions for this case. You, we are going to be evaluating the progression of failure in the upstream and downstream direction and in the cross canyon direction. And um, that can lead to different uh, paths to failure that we will evaluate through the event tree. So there are, there are geometric um, things to keep in mind about so the, the ge geometry of the pier is going to affect the seismic response. So for example, a stiffer pier may attract more load while a more flexible pier may relieve that load through deflection. But like I said, it could lead you down a different failure path. And I'm going to explain that through the event tree a little bit more. Here we have the event tree for this failure mode. Like I mentioned, there are multiple paths to failure and it can get a little confusing to evaluate because not only are you evaluating um, the moment capacity of the structure, but you're evaluating the shear capacity of the structure and then you're evaluating both in the upstream and downstream direction and in the cross canyon direction. So you need to make sure that you're accounting for all that within your event tree and that you're checking all the boxes of, of the capacity in each direction and for each failure mechanism. So first, and like I mentioned before, for this failure to occur, for this failure uh, mode to occur, you have to have both loading, the pool loading and the seismic loading. 
So in this case, the first note in the event tree is going to be your pool duration. When you're evaluating the seismic, a seismic failure mode, the um, probability of failure is annualized through the seismic hazard. So make sure that you're not using the pool frequency curve in this case, but you're going to be using the pool duration curve. So that would be node one in this uh, for this failure event tree. The second node is the seismic hazard. So the the probability that you're going to have a certain acceleration at this project at this site. Make sure that you're accounting for the entire loading curve. Don't cut it off too soon and you uh, make sure that you have enough load ranges to, to account for the risk at the site. Next, you're evaluating whether your cracking moment exceeds I mean, whether your calculated moment exceeds your cracking moment. So what this means is if, you're, if your moment is less than your cracking moment, you are not going to, you're not going to be uh, evaluating this, the structure and bending, but you're going to be evaluating the structure only based on the shear capacity. In this case, you have an intact concrete section and you evaluate shear based on the intact concrete um, shear strength. But if your moment exceeds your cracking moment, then it takes you into the next portion of the event tree, which is seen up here, and you start evaluating the reinforcement response to bending. All right, so looking at the reinforcement response to bending, the you calculate the likelihood that the reinforcement is yielding based on the computing moments at critical sections of the pier. These are typically at the base of the pier at your OG crust and also at an intermediate elevation where you might be transitioning from larger rebar to smaller rebar. Make sure that you um, are looking at splice lengths and at, at maybe those locations you might be going to a, um, a concrete that has a lower compressive strength. So keep in mind where those transitions occur, and that might be the location that you need to evaluate this failure mode as well. So for these, eva for these locations that you're evaluating this failure mode, you need to calculate your uh, moments, and you can do that using pseudo-static analysis, pseudo-dynamic analysis. It doesn't, uh, you can use different methodology. But regardless of the methodology that you use, you need to make sure that you're accounting for the amplification of the seismic acceleration. The accelerations are going to be amplified from the base of your of your dam to that crest elevation and then further amplified through your pier structure as well. You're going to be evaluating the moments and the shears both in the upstream and downstream direction and both in the cross canyon direction. So you have to look at whether your reinforcement yields in both of those directions and then decide where that takes you within your event tree. We have an example fragility curve in the best practices documentation that is uh, that uses the moment demand to capacity ratio to, e to establish a probability of flexural yielding. This, uh, as you can see here, it's both for lightly reinforced sections and for adequately, adequately reinforced concrete sections. So you can use this as a starting point. This fragility curve can be changed by the team, can be recreated by the team if needed, if you have differing conditions at your site that make you want to make adjustments to this fragility curve. But an example and a starting point is included in best practices. So again, so this is where we are in the event tree. If your cracking moment is not exceeded, you evaluate shear down here of a uncracked section. If your moment does exceed the cracking moment, then you move on to evaluate the reinforcement response to bending. If the reinforcement yields, the likelihood for the shear failure is estimated again but then you use a cracked concrete section with yielded reinforcement. So let me, let me kind of make sure that everybody's following me. So if your moment exceeds your cracking moment, you're up here. If your reinforcement yields, 
then you also still need to evaluate your shear capacity, assuming that not only do you have a cracked concrete section, but you have yielded reinforcement. If, you, if your reinforcement remains elastic, though, you also evaluate shear. But in this case, you still have a cracked concrete section, but you have unyielded reinforcement. So you have three situations or three cases in which you need to evaluate that shear capacity. If that reinforcement yields, you evaluate shear, and then you also move on to evaluate deflections and deformations at, of the pier and what those deflections are doing to the gate that's attached to the pier. Is it putting additional load on the gate? Could it potentially fail the gate? And you get a failure and uncontrolled release of pool through failure of your gate. If your reinforcement remains elastic, again, you evaluate shear, and then you evaluate what your probability of failure is from that shear capacity with unyielded reinforcement. So we also have an example fragility curve for shear capacity in best practices, which is shown here. Again, just like in the moment capacity, this is a starting point and can, can be um, evaluated with by the team and can be uh, changed by the team depending on the conditions at your site. All right, so like I mentioned, this is, a, this is a pretty convoluted event tree. So just a few things to just keep in mind is that you have multiple paths to failure and multiple failure mechanisms that you're evaluating. You're evaluating shear, you're evaluating moment, you're evaluating shear based on cracked or uncracked conditions in your concrete, and you're evaluating shear based on yielded or unyielded reinforcement. And then for each of those mechanisms, both shear and moment, you're evaluating loading in the upstream and downstream direction and in the cross canyon direction. And hopefully this failure mode kind of, I mean, this event tree walks you through that failure progression. So other, other things to keep in mind when you're evaluating this failure mode is that the gate is anchored to the pier. And additional load is going to be transferred from the gate to the pier under seismic loading. And those hydrodynamic loads can be large. And the pier has not been designed to carry on not only that additional load on the pier itself, but that load, that additional load that is put on the gate due to the seismic acceleration and then transferred to the pier. So um, this is just an example of an additional failure mechanism that can occur. So you are, you could have a shear failure due to that downward component from the gate anchorage. You need to evaluate the gate anchorage. You need to evaluate the uh, pin. So there's lots of things working in this, in, and everything's occurring at the same time. So keep in mind those, those, um, the failure path, I guess, when you're evaluating this failure mode because it can um, add some additional failure mechanisms that are just, that you would have to evaluate as well, separate from just the moment and shear capacity at these um, locations that were previously discussed. All right, so some, some key factors influencing this failure mode. So like I mentioned earlier, this, this failure mode is, is, is also explained and directly related to the presentation for reinforced concrete failure mechanisms. So um, the pure geometry, the moment capacity, the shear capacity, all those have been discussed under that different um, presentation. Um, again, obviously we are gonna be looking at the reservoir water surface elevation for this case, that um, combined probability of it occurring at the same time as the seismic loading. Seismic hazard plays a key component here, especially in areas, like I said, in, in the West Coast where you might have a si high seismic hazard with also high pools. Um, some additional considerations, and I'll go into this in a little bit, is uh, spillway bridges, the gate loads, how those gate loads are transferred onto the pier, the training anchorage, and the evaluation of multiple piers, which I will go into as well. <clears throat> 
So st starting off with pure geometry. So pure geometry affects a seismic load. A stiffer pier may attract more load, while a more flexible pier may relieve that load through deflection. But when you have a more flexible pier and you have that deflection, that's when a nonlinear evaluation may actually be more important because you need to uh, evaluate that nonlinear behavior of the concrete and the steel. So some things to think about because um, it might influence the analysis that you use to evaluate this failure mode. The response of the pier depends on the frequency of the pier and the dam and the frequency constant of the earthquake. The response depends on whether the crest structure is founded on rock or soil, although hopefully you're not evaluating a mass concrete dam on a, on a soil foundation. Uh, it's also dependent on the configuration of the abutment on whether the spillway is on the crest of your of your structure or if it's in a rock abutment off to the side, which is very uh, common, uh, you might not have such a tall concrete section. So you might not have the amplification. If your pier was, for example, in the valley center and orientation of the embankment with respect to the spillway crest structure. So these are all things to keep in mind related to the geometry of the pier and the location of the pier within the rest of your dam. All right, so moment and shear capacity. Make sure to use expected values for this evaluation and the um, reinforcement and concrete properties, not design values. So when you're, for example, when you're looking at the yielding, the yield strength of your reinforcement, don't use minimum values, use mean values. The same with com compressive strength of your concrete. Don't use the 28 day compressive strength. Make sure that you're aging the concrete. Make sure that you're accounting for that the expected value is going to be greater than that minimum required capacity. Uh, directionality of the ground motion is important. If directivity is included in de the development of the ground motions, it would not be appropriate to arbitrarily apply the, the largest component in either the upstream and downstream or in the cross canyon direction. So make sure that you have an understanding of how those seismic loads are generated and how those uh, should be assigned or attributed to your structure. If directivity is not included, then it is appropriate to vary the application of the, those two horizontal components to determine the critical uh, condition. Uh, location of the maximum moment and shear. Um, is the reinforcement developed? Could there be other areas where the moment and shear are lower, but the reinforcement is reduced? So for example, the moment is going to be greatest at your at the crest if your pier is unrestrained at the top, and usually that's the location where you have your maximum reinforcement as well. But what if your pier is restrained at the top by the bridge, then your moment distribution is gonna be different. Are you increasing the moment at a location where you might be transferring that reinforcement to smaller reinforcement? So these are all things that you need to consider when you're evaluating this failure mode in addition to what we've talked about, the upstream and downstream cross canyon, um, shear versus moment, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this, um, in this failure mode. Uh, like I said, a pseudostatic analysis can be used to evaluate those shear and moments. Uh, make sure that you're evaluating amplification of their loads. Um, a time history analysis in these cases might provide a more complete picture of what this failure mode looks like and the probability of, of failure because it gives you more information about the extent of overstressing and the number of excursions of that overstressing. So that may be very important information when you're evaluating the probability of failure. And especially if you have yielding of your reinforcement and um, cracking of your concrete and rupture of your reinforcement, looking at a nonlinear non behavior through finite element analysis may be required, especially if you're looking at um, making modifications to your structure. So seismic hazard, if the reservoir is only up for the gates for limited durations, make sure that you're accounting for that through your pull duration curve. Um, 
Um, some spillway piers do have some reserve capacity beyond the stress levels created by the static loads. But again, a lot of times we see in, especially in the Corps of Engineers, my experience has been that, for example, concrete dams were designed with a 0.1 G acceleration for stability for sliding analysis, but then the reinforced concrete was not designed uh, with a seismic load in mind. So this structure may have never been designed for any seismic loading. Uh, and if it was designed for some seismic loading, it probably wasn't significant. Um, when you're evaluating the seismic hazard, and I mentioned when we were discussing event trees, make sure that you're evaluating for the entire load curve required under the risk evaluation. That may be beyond 10,000 year return period that uh, you might have to extend it out to 50,000 or 100,000, depending on, on the dam that you're evaluating and the consequences due to this failure mode. But those can, create situations where you're looking at accelerations that are really very large. So we have examples of uh, reclamation having to evaluate some of their structures for uh, accelerations greater than 1G. And then, of course, the level of that seismic loading in combination with that, that static loading, with that pool loading, it's going to determine the level of overstress in your pier. So depending on how the bridge is attached to the pier and to the end walls, you might have to make different uh, assumptions about that bridge and how that affects the uh, load on your structure. The bridge may be accelerated with the piers and transmit inertial loads to the top of the pier without really providing much lateral support or, they br or the bridge may actually serve as a strut to create a structural frame across the entire crest structure, which in turn reduces the moment at the sh and the shears at the base of the pier. So the geometry and the interaction of the pier and the spillway bridge should be considered in the analysis. And if there's uncertainty on how that bridge is gonna behave under the seismic loading and, it, and you're sensitive to that uncertainty, then a, a, a sensitivity analysis should be done to evaluate both cases and see how much that uh, assumption changes your risk. So again, you know, if um, if if you're if if the pier becomes restrained because of that that bridge, you might be reducing the moment at that crest, and you might be changing the maximum moment to a higher elevation, like we've discussed. So you might be able, you might have to be looking at a different uh, um, elevation for your failure path. So this becomes a, an important assumption that may uh, have a big impact on your final probability of failure. Like we've mentioned, the, the loads from the gate are going to be transferred to through the pier and through the uh, Tronian anchorage. So those are things that need to be considered. The hydrodynamic interaction has to be included and uh, that load transferred to the pier. We can evaluate that load on the gate using Westergaard's added mass, which can be is a function of the seismic uh, coefficient and it's related to that horizontal acceleration and it's applied to the gate as the load and then transferred onto the pier. Um, but this can also be evaluated using three-dimensional finite element analyses. Uh, we have multiple uh, avenues to calculate that load that's transferred from the gate to the pier, but it most definitely needs to be included. Uh, you can do you can use pseudostatic analysis or pseudodynamic analysis as a as a starting point before you go into finite element analysis as needed. But again, the time history analysis in these cases can be very important because it gives you that information about how much overstress is occurring. So evaluation of multiple peers. Um, this is very similar to, to evaluation of multiple gate failures, but uh, when you're evaluating the probability of a failure of a peer, you're actually calculating the probability of any one peer failing. So when you have multiple peers, you have to calculate the probability that you would have one peer failing, two peers failing, three peers failing, and so on. And we do that using uh, Pascal's triangle or the binomial theorem. And uh, that's shown here on this table uh, and these equations right here. So it gives you the probability that 
you would have no peers failing, one peer failing, two peer failing, and so on. It's also important to capture though, that if your probability of failure is low, the probability of having multiple failures is also going to be re remain low. But the, if the probability of failing is high, which could very well be the case with, re with those high seismic accelerations, you might be looking at a failure mode that's driven by multiple failures, which is shown kind of here at the end. So if your probability of a single peer failing is high, you're going to be driven, your risk is going to be driven by having larger breaches because all the gates, I mean, not well, gates too, but in this case, peers, all the peers were designed for the same load. So those, uh, that high probability is going to carry through and give you a high probability that you're going to have multiple peers failing. So that's, it, it can create a weird FN chart, but it's something to keep in mind because you can see that reversal in what breach scenario drives uh, your, prop, your risk in this case. Also is important to make sure that not only are you evaluating those multiple breach scenarios or those multiple peer scenarios, I should say, but where those failures occur can also be important. And this is just an example of how depending on where, which peers you're expecting to fail can change how you establish what that breach width is and in turn affect your consequence estimates. So make sure that you're not taking the most conservative or unconservative approach in estimating which peers would fail. Because in this case, it can increase the, um, the weighted average loss of life depending on which fail or it could decrease. So make sure you're not taking an unconservative approach to that. So we've um, we've had a, just recently we've had a lot of these failure modes that are driving risk at, at, at different dams and we've had to come up with ways that we can evaluate this failure mode in a more in a, in a manner that's a little bit more quick especially just to do semi-quantitative risk assessments because these structures were never designed for this loading. We don't have any analysis that can help us determine what those, what those qualitative estimates are. So we've, we have a methodology for screening of these failure modes, uh, or for peers in particular and for gates too, but for, for seismic failure modes in particular. What that, e what that evaluates is that you look at what your moments are and you compare them to your cracking moments. And you also evaluate whether um, you have reinforcement yielding. And then you look at those probabilities and you compare those to the Talibor risk guidelines and de decide whether you're above or below that societal risk guideline. Um, this can allow you to be able to screen out projects that where this won't drive risk. And it also gives you the information that it might be driving risk and that you might need a more detailed analysis. I do want to capture though that these screening analyses of just looking at the cracking moment and looking at reinforcement of uh, yielding of reinforcement are not meant to be analysis for decisions. So you would not use these analyses to make the decision to go into a dam safety mod study and modify the dam. These are specific to evaluate whether more in-depth analysis is needed, potentially to through a time history analysis and doing a finite element analysis. Some of the things to keep in mind when you're doing these screening methodology, uh, screening analyses is that you can use the pseudodynamic analysis to give you information about what the amplification is in the upstream and downstream direction, but you also need to account for amplification in the cross canyon direction that's occurring through the canyon. Um, for a screening analysis, we use 1.5. That is a project specific assumption, but because we don't have a 3D finite element analysis to give us how that that seismic acceleration is uh, changing through the canyon in that direction, we make the assumption of using 1.5 uh, for screening. Uh, that would be an assumption that would have to be calibrated and, and um, 
evaluated through a finite element analysis if you were to determine that you needed to go into a modification of the dam of and of the piers due to seismic loading. For, uh, when If you're doing a pseudostatic analysis, make sure that you're using a pseudostatic correction factor. In this case, we use two thirds. And again, if there's lots of issues with three dimensionality, nonlinear behavior of the structure, you really need to go into a finite element analysis, which is shown in this slide. This is an example of an analysis that was done by uh, Bureau of Reclamation, where a linear elastic analysis was showing that the, the risk from the pier was above our tolerable risk guidelines. But then when a full nonlinear analysis was done, it showed that you did have significant concrete uh, cracking of the concrete. You did have significant reinforcement yielding, but although there was damage, there wasn't a full collapse or full failure. So you didn't have widespread rupturing of your reinforcement or widespread cracking and crumbling and crushing of your concrete. So like I mentioned, we have a, a quick Case history to give you here, this is Shikang Dam in Taiwan. It's a concrete gravity dam with an 18 bay gated spillway. It was located, well it is located about 30 miles from the epicenter of the Chi Chi earthquake that occurred in 1999. Uh, the Chelungpu fault passed uh, underneath the spillway and ruptured during the earthquake and there was a vertical offset of 32 to 36 feet um, at, at this location in the dam. Uh, this is a case history that you're going to be hearing about in multiple presentations across best practices. But um, this is what happened to the dam spillway. You can see that there was significant damage, significant offset, but miraculously the, the gates remained uh, holding pool. The, the structure remained holding pool. The dam itself was able to still hold pool so there wasn't an uncontrolled release. One thing to keep in mind though is that during the time of the earthquake the pool was not to the gate. The, it, it wasn't loading the gate. So in this case in particular we didn't have those large hydrodynamic loads that were being transferred from the gate to the pier. But one of the things to to um, that I wanted to mention, and the reason why we have this example here is because it we can see that they they went back and looked at where cracking of the concrete was occurring. And the cracking was following the OG um, section, the OG crust. And in some locations, it was following lift lines. You can see here that you had cracking just above the trunnion of the gate and probably at an area where you had a difference in geometry and then a transition of your reinforcement. So although there wasn't a, a full collapse here, it does give us a case history and an example of that failure path and progression of multiple locations and potentially multiple uh, paths to failure that we evaluate using our event tree. Just quickly, here is a peer, uh, an exercise of evaluating the inertial load on a peer for different reoccurring intervals for uh, earthquake acceleration. Um, here, we just want to point out that this, in this example, you're calculating the period of the structure so that you can calculate the, um, the uh, amplification of your load through the pier itself. And in this case, um, the magnification factor for the pier is 2.1, but that is in addition to that magnification of the seismic acceleration through the canyon and through the entire dam, which like I mentioned in the screening, we assume is 1.5. So I just wanted to, to show you that in an example. This is the, the shear stresses at the base of the pier. In this example, we did not have pool on the pier, so hydrodynamic and hydrostatic loads are not included. And in this case, um, the calculated shear is lower than the stated shear capacity in the problem statement. So the 
the probabilities of failure due to shear are estimated to be very low.